President Bala Tinubu has warned that persons taking undue advantage of the nationwide protests to threaten other Nigerians will be dealt with. In his address to the country, President Tinubu promised to maintain order and not to allow a few with a clear political agenda to divide the nation. He says the law will be visited upon anyone using the situation to perpetrate ethnic bigotry. Nigeria has been rocked by a 10-day demonstration against economic hardship and bad governance. In the northern part of the country, the protests turned violent, leading to destruction of public and private properties. In the south, the protests have been largely peaceful, except for a few skirmishes. Under the circumstances, I have enjoined protesters and the organizers to suspend any further protest and create room for dialogue, which I have always acceded to at the slightest opportunity. Nigeria requires all hands on deck and it owes all, regardless of age, party, tribe, religion, or other divides, to work together reshaping our destiny as a nation. To those who have taken undue advantage of this situation, to threaten any section of this country, be warned. The law will catch up with you. There is no place for ethnic bigotry or such threats in the Nigeria we seek to build. Our democracy progresses when the constitutional rights of every Nigerian are respected and protected. Our law enforcement agencies should continue to ensure full protection of life and properties of innocent citizens in a responsible manner. Well, for more on this, I'm joined in the studio by Mrs. Ifoma Okali. Ojemene. She is a retired UN diplomat and former lead prosecutor of the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. She's also an international criminal law and gender expert. Welcome to the program, madam. It is Mrs. Ifoma Ojemeni Okali. Yes. <laughs> we made a mistake Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Thank but, you. But, you know, great to have you here. Thank you. Thank okay. You. So, nice Nigeria has there. been battling you know, cases or incidents of people promoting hate against one another. As a, as a former prosecutor at the International Tribunal, Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, can you define for us what is hate speech? Hate speech, um, first and foremost, there's no universal definition of hate speech. But according to the UN strategy and pl plan uh, of action for hate speech. It defines it as a communication, any, any communication in speech or in, in writing or behavior that attacks or uses uh, pejoratory, um, uh, uh, pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group because of the person's, of who the person is. So basically what I'm saying is any form of expression of um, language that you know suggests uh, d discriminatory or disparaging or dishumanizing a person or a group of persons because of their nationality, ethnicity, gender, color, descent, religion, and other factors could be termed hate speech. Okay, can you briefly tell us how you got into the prosecution at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda? Um, I was a lawyer in Nigeria uh, for 15 years. 
um, mostly a solicitor, so to speak, and then, you know, a federal uh, prosecutor for the um, financial malpractices uh, under NDIC those days. Um, but somehow, I, it was a bit, my work, it was fulfilling though, but it was a bit um, monotonous. I needed something more. So when tribunal came on board and they were looking for lawyers to um, assist in trying the, uh, those responsible for genocide in Rwanda, I got interested having you know, practiced for 15 years. And that was how I applied to the United Nations and I was employed as a trial attorney then before I moved on to senior trial attorney and started leading cases. So that was my interest and that was how I got in. Also, can you tell us what makes uh, hate speech and ethnic profiling dangerous in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious country like Nigeria? Um, first and foremost, let me say that there is strength in diversity. But when some um, hooligans decide to, you know, cause problems uh, or to do something that will divide us, uh, they get involved with this hate speech. So hate speech in effect, what I'm saying is that hate speech has the effect of undermining social cohesion or it also erodes uh, shared values and it lays foundation for um, atrocity, what we call atrocity crimes like um, genocide, uh, human, um, crime as against humanity, war crimes. And it also undermines, in a way, undermines national uh, peace, uh, unity, um, sustainable uh, um, development and also um, the main fulfillment, it rubs off, us off of the main fulfillment of uh, human rights for all. From your experience, what can you tell us about early signs, warnings of this kind of, uh, you know, profiling that can escalate to a broader societal harm? Sharing my experience with Rwanda, um, I would say first and foremost, or learning from Rwandan experience, um, it starts off, you know, it doesn't start the day that, you know, the, um, the mayhem, you know, occur. It starts, it predates, you know, a mayhem. Uh, for Rwandan experience, it started well as far back as 1959 when the um, Hutus had what they call Ten Commandments, uh, where they, you know, stated what, how the Tutsis will be killed and how you have to look out for Tutsi, what should be done, and, uh, you know, just their, their commandment, uh, you know, for their, the Hutus. Because what happened in Rwanda was the Hutus killed Tutsis and moderate Tutsis. And this killing occurred within uh, um, about 800 people died within 100 days. Um, 800,000. 800,000, I'm sorry. 800,000 yes. died within uh, 100 days. And it, 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 the, the, that genocide started well, you know, before 1994 when it occurred. And as I've mentioned, the Ten Commandments was there. So the um, communication, people, the Hutus, use media, use the um, um, use, uh, media, include radio, um, circulated, you know, their leaders also circulated meetings, circulated uh, documents and brainwashed, you know, the people. So the early warning will be definitely starting from hate speech, derogatory statements, um, dehumanizing statements, um, discriminatory statements, you know. So when you see such flying around as, it, as it's happening now, 
you know, that's the trending issue in Nigeria. Um, you, you, government has to do something about it. And I'm happy that the president, you know, mentioned that in his speech, at least considered it worth, you know, talking about. And secondly, Lagos State government also, you know, denied uh, being involved because there are some sort of, you know, uh, discriminatory statements flying around in the media. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. You can, like the president said, all hands have to be on deck to see that uh, it's called nipped in the uh, board. But one thing is to condemn it. Another thing is to see that all those drivers of his speech are fished out and punished for, um, for deterrence purposes. Not until that is done, although some it's already been done in, you know, in some cases, but again, it's something that government should consider serious. Because when it starts, the monster that it will create will last for decades. I mean, you know, when you talk about when it starts, last year during the elections, it happened some people were prevented from voting and then some other people who were not of that ethnic group were wrongly profiled. So anything can happen to anybody and, you know, like you said, it's dangerous. Well, let's try to draw parallels. You know, you've been to Rwanda, you've, you know, talked about that. There was also, you know, Bosnia and Holocaust. Tell us a bit, just a bit of what you know about how, this, how these things play out. Okay. HPs first and foremost, not just in Nigeria, not just a particular group because it's been circulating in Nigeria yes. amongst other, you know, it can be uh, any tribes. It can group. be any, any, any ethnic group. But if you draw experience from what happened in Rwanda, what happened in Bosnia, the Muslims were killed. It was a religious you know, um, conflict. Um, if you judge what happened in, it's still happening in Southern Sudan, um, still religious. Uh, the Rohingya um, Muslims. Muslims are also being perpetuated, you know, de dehumanized in uh, Maya, uh, Mema, Maya, Mema. Um, uh, um, Russia is also uh, stigmatizing uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine uh, um, refugees. So, I mean, there are many places that uh, hate space have been, you know, contributing to violence, um, hostility, uh, discrimination. So some people in authority might say this is trifling, it's inconsequential. What do you say to that? Um, it's only somebody who's not seen what happened in the past, even in Nigeria, that can say so. Because if we trace history back, there are so many things, many tribes have gone against each other. And it's all started with stigmatization, um, um, scapegoating, um, uh, dehumanization. And um, if we witness, especially if we witness some of these um, conflicts, and we still see them playing out always I mean, on the media, um, also on uh, social, um, social platforms. And somebody still says it's a trivial affair, then obviously the person is not uh, being truthful to his, himself. Tell us a bit about the biggest lesson that you learned prosecuting in Rwanda. The biggest lesson I learned is that people should learn to tolerate one another because that's how it starts. People should learn to love one another. There should be neighborliness, because this thing starts from home. You know, if anything, we should learn and mind how we talk. Um, it's, it's, you know, deeper hatred. It's not something that, you know, when I saw witnesses or listened to witnesses talk, and you see that these witnesses did not just 
get up on their own to try, I mean, to kill um, a, a Tusi, you know. It started right away from when the child, the person was born, hearing the parents talk about, you know, about Tusis and um, in a, 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 a demeaning, a, a demeaning uh, manner and um, talking about um, how pretty they are, um, how uh, they've been benefiting from the colonial masters and they were, you know, uh, deprived from, you know, progressing or getting uh, um, good jobs and um, how more or less imported uh, ideology, colonial ideologies. And then um, when you, after listening to, and then how um, witnesses, a witness will tell you that he killed the mother simply because the mother is a Tusi, or he killed the wife because the wife is a Tusi, or killed the children because they have Tusi blood in them. You know, after listening to such, I said to myself, there's need for me to get back home and talk to my people. Because when you think about what happened during the in Biafran War and what is happening, the tribal wars that we've been having now, we've been killing people mercilessly. I mean, it's only somebody that needs to, you know, I mean, the government, will, of course, partnering with government and, you know, the stakeholders that will be able to, you know, nip this in the board because we can see it playing out now. So how that's one good lesson that I picked that up from there. How difficult was it to prosecute the, the offenders in Rwanda? It and then even them me. coming face to face with with the, the victims in, in court, were they eventually, you know, given justice? How did it all end? Well, they were given judgment, I mean justice. Um, because at the end of the day, um, the Rwandans, of course, the, victim, the victims, the survivors, you know, were happy. And Rwanda also helped a lot with the gachacha uh, system. What's the gachacha? Gachacha system is the traditional system that's after such killings, you know, uh, it, it, there's need for reconciliation. So through reconciliation and what they used was the agachacha system, which is where dialoguing, you know, and where, you know, advocacy, you know, letting, uh, creating awareness and letting them know, which is, which tribunal was also part of, letting them know that such, you know, um, hatred should not be, um, should not continue. Right. And then the more reason was for them to understand the root causes and then for the drivers to also to understand that what they did was wrong. Very briefly, do you have key recommendations for policymakers and the public in Nigeria in what we're dealing with very briefly? Yes, there's need for awareness to be created. There's need for education. There's need for training for people to understand that they should love one another. And there's need for the government to you know, in, in, um, to create more policies, you know, practices, and um, involve, partner with uh, stakeholders like uh, civil societies, individuals, private, you know, um, private, um, pa uh, private companies and NGOs to, you know, partner with them to be able to um, educate the public right from grassroots to, um, uh, top level, okay. all the religious um, leaders okay. should be involved, all the leaders okay. that come in a local uh, leaders should also be involved in that. Okay. So training, education and advocacy. Mrs. Ifoma Ojemeni Okali, thank you so much for being on Arise Prime Time. Thank you. Well, that's it for this edition of Arise Prime Time. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye and thank you for watching.